Alternative Transformation, Hot Stone Technology and the Clombrin Shield, Dr. Sally Herriot. There are many ways that skin can be processed to become a useful material or artefact. Sadly, from a prehistoric perspective, much of this transformation does not impart a permanence and being organic, skin seldom survives within the archaeological record. Nonetheless, peat bog environments do have the potential to preserve and one such artefact, the Clombrin Shield, was recovered from an Irish peat bog in 1909. Many of you may be familiar with discussion and experimentation with hot rocks and the use of filoc fowl employed for cooking and heating water to clean fleece and hides. This paper seeks to present a complementary use combining ethnographic in investigation and experimental practice to widen the application of hot stone technology and establish an alternative narrative for the production of the Clonbrin shield. This is the Clonbrin shield, dated to the Bronze Age and considered to be made from leather. It is approximately 500 millimetres in diameter and is between 4 to 5 millimetres thick. It has a central boss surrounded by three rings. Between these are sets of button-like detail. The central boss enables a hand to hold the handle. The fixing stitches for this can be seen on the face. It has an additional cap over the boss of 3 to 4 millimetres thick. Whilst this could be seen as reinforcement, it actually covers a split and so should be seen as a repair. The handle also indicates that the shield may not have had any backing or support, but today it is floppy and requires support. This is George Caitlin. He travelled across America in the 1800s, drawing, painting and writing about indigenous people. The painting on the right is titled Smoking the Shield and show, shows Sioux warriors processing buffalo skin to make war shields. Caitlin notes that this war shield is made of the skin of the buffalo neck and hardened with the glue from hooves. He states they stretched and pegged the skin over the hot coals of a fire where it was allowed to shrink and thicken. It was this evidence from Caitlin in 1844 that sparked this particular aspect of my research. There have been several recreations of this shield by John Coles and more recently by Neil Burridge and Barry Malloy. All have been made from leather, which is further processed using a combination of hot water and or wax, which is known as cur boulet. Once treated, the hot waxy leather is placed in a mould and allowed to dry and becomes hard. This process has been used to make a range of tough leather artefacts from Roman armour to Tudor drinking bottles. However, Caitlin's narrative offers an alternative scenario. This paper combines ethnographic observation with an archaeological evidence of hot stone technology and experimental investigation and questions not just the use of hot water and wax, but also the use of the leather itself. This paper presents this unique method from preparation of skin to application of heat and steam to moulding and finally testing the shield to establish its capability to perform as a martial object. These photographs show the neck area of a hide from a domestic beef cow. The smaller image, top right, shows the thickness of this skin. The image on the left is the inside or flesh side and the right is the outside with the hair. Once the skin had been removed from the animal, it will start to decay and some sort of processing needs to start as soon as possible. Because the original Clombrin shield has a smooth outer surface with no evidence of stubble, an alternative to scraping or shaving off the hair needed to be employed. Whilst the skin could be left to putrefy, which causes the hair follicles to loosen their hold so they can be, the hair can be pulled out, a quicker, less smelly method was needed and so the skin was bucked. 
Bucking involves a paste being made from wood, ash and water that is spread over the hair side of the skin and left. This cool stick ash causes the skin to swell or plump up, the hair follicles to expand, thus releasing their hair hold on the hair so that it can easily be pulled out. These three pictures show the stages of bucking. The wood ash paste was spread over the hair, as seen in the image on the left. The hide was checked on a daily basis to see if the hair could be pulled out, and after four days it came away easily. In the middle image you can see how the hair has been simply rubbed or pulled out, reve revealing the skin below. And on the right you can see how the hair can be lifted off in clumps. This image shows the different layers of the skin. On the left is the hair, still in the follicle. The greyish colour on the right is where the hair has been pulled out and you can see the grain layer. This is what gives the shield its smooth outside surface. In the middle you can see an almost white stripe where the grain has been scraped away. This would end up ultimately as a soft, fluffy texture. With the hair gone, the inside or flesh side needs to have any fat and membrane removed. In the left picture, you can see where the ash has stuck to the fat. In the right, how clean the skin is once the fat, etc. has been scraped away. Once removed, the skin is washed in cold water to tighten it up and it is ready for heat treating. I work predominantly on my own, so to hold the skin over the heat it was laced into a frame, as seen on the left. The skin is not tied in tightly to allow it to shrink without snapping the strings. Top right is the view between the skin across the hot stones, with bottom right showing the steam coming off the skin after it has been sprayed with water. To shape the shield, it needed to be moulded. Left is what is considered to be a mould of comparable date to that of the shield. Both this and the shield itself are held in the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin. On the right is my mould. Unfortunately, my carpentry skills did not include being able to carve the small button-like details noted on the shield, but these were not considered vital for any structural integrity. With heat, the skin starts to shrink and thicken. The skin became, before it became too small for the mould was untied and laid grain side down on the mould. The skin was manipulated to fill the boss and the pebble was used to hold the shape. Left image shows the first shield. Hoops of willow were used to shape the rings, but this was difficult as the grooves in the mould had not been carved deep enough to allow for both the skin and the willow hoop. Consequently, with the pebble and just one hoop in place, heavy planks and weights were put on top to hold it flat and it was left in an outbuilding to cure. After 10 days, the skin was dry and the weights and planks were removed. The willow forming the inner ring sprang out of place, leaving a clear, partially formed hoop ridge on the left image. Before the second shield was moulded, the central boss and the rings were enlarged. The middle picture shows the second shield when the mould was first opened. You can see that rope was added with the stone to increase the size of the boss, and this and the hoops all worked well. Although again the hoops were fiddly to put in and keep in place as the planks were put on top. A third shield was attempted, however due to inclement weather and difficulties with timing, this shield did not heat well and it became brittle and cracked when moulded. On the right is the fourth and most successful of the shields. Again, the use of the pebble and rope had formed the boss well, and on this shield the rings were also formed using ropes, which again was very successful. When the planks were removed, a soft white mould was seen across its surface. This was because a light spray of water had been applied to soften the skin to make it easier to push into the rings. 
This shield was also still a little soft, which was seen as an opportunity to allow holes to be made either side of the boss to allow the cord to hold the handle in place. The previous shields had all come out of the mould far too hard to allow this. This is the fourth shield. On the left you can see the white mould and the imprint left by the rope. Once dry this mould was simply scraped off. On the right you can see the outside of the boss with the ridges in the background. Because this shield was slightly soft when the mould was opened, this made making the holes to secure a handle very easy and a piece of buckskin was immediately threaded through. The buckskin is the pale area either side of the boss in the left photograph. The right photograph shows how the handle is secured. This fourth shield was the most successfully moulded. The boss was well formed, being both large enough for the hand and some padding to help absorb a blow. And the three concentric rings, whilst are not perfect, are distinct and obviously support its rigidity. They also give the shield the recognisable form of the one from Clon Bryn. But does this processing method produce a shield that can function as a martial object? The left photograph showed the shield being hit using a bronze sword. It was repeatedly struck across the face, hitting the boss and rings and on its outer edge or rim. The shield performed exceedingly well. The point of the sword could not puncture it and this action only left slight surface scratches. When blows were aimed at the boss, the strike did not cause it to permanently dent or split. In the middle photograph, slight damage can be seen when the shield was hit on its edge or rim as the series of small notches or nicks. Additionally, whilst the shield flexed Slight, flexed slightly as the edge was struck, it certainly did not flex enough to cause concern that it might fail to protect the person holding it. Importantly, the shield did not bend or crumple back onto the arm of the person holding it when hit. Rather, it absorbed the blows. The photograph on the right shows the shield held up in an upright position. As you can see that although it is not completely flat, it is rigid and does not require any further backing or support. This means that not only is it sturdy, but it is very light, which allows an active fighting stance to be taken. This enables the carrier to attack with the shield, striking with the rim and then quickly employing it back to a defensive position to protect. Importantly, this shield is now several years old and this flexibility and sturdiness is still very evident. In addition to the experimental reconstruction presented here, my research has also involved the deposition of differently processed animal skin into a peat bog environment, results from which have demonstrated that leather and rawhide shrink in a similar manner, as can be seen in the graph. This demonstrates the potential for rawhide to be mistaken for leather. When this is combined with the understanding that heat treated method is certainly capable of making a shield quickly and without additional ingredients and that the shield has all the attributes required of a practical martial object in that it's light, robust, flexible and durable, then these results certainly query the use of hot water and or beeswax as the hardening method considered both for the original Clombrin shield and the ensuing reconstructions. It also calls into question the labelling of many skin-based artefacts recovered from peat bogs as being made of leather. 
Consequently, this alternative method and the resulting material has the potential to provide valuable insight into skin-based material culture that is often sadly missing in the prehistoric archaeological record and provides a credible alternative to the current thinking that everything skin-based recovered from a peat bog was originally made from leather. Thank you for your interest in my research.